In these uncertain economic times, you've got to do whatever you can to save money. One of our biggest expenses can be our cars, especially when unexpected repair bills hit. Not anymore. If you own a vehicle with less than 130,000 miles, is less than 12 years old, has a warranty about to expire, or even no warranty at all, you could stop paying for car repairs. Roadside assistance, towing, and rental coverage are all included. Don't wait for the next repair. Make one free call right now to see if you qualify. If your vehicle vehicle is less than 12 years old, has less than 130,000 miles, even if it's out of warrant. In these uncertain economic times, you've got to do what? Letters coming in added up to a nightmare. To get up to like $68,000. That's 800-696-1030. 800-696-1030. Joe had huge problems with the IRS. I knew it was coming. I hadn't filed taxes since 1990. All the IRS letters coming in added up to a nightmare. They got up to like $68,000. My heart started beating fast. It's like, there's no way, man. I mean, I ain't going to be able to do this. Then they stopped his paycheck. So that's when I started making phone calls and found U.S. Tax Shield. U.S. Tax Shield went to work immediately. They just took the bull by the horns. What blew my mind is he called the IRS right then and there. So why is U.S. Tax Shield A-plus rated with the Better Business Bureau? Joe knows. They saved me a ridiculous amount of money. If you owe more than $10,000 to the IRS or state, choose the company Joe chose, U.S. Tax Shield. It was the best decision I made. U.S. Tax Shield is the way to go. Life is good. Thank you, Lord. <laughs> Call 800-471-3287. U.S. Tax Shield. Boo raw. Yes. <laughs> 800-471-3287. 800-471-3287. Wake up, America. The biggest threat in those days were from factions seizing control of the governing apparatus and making decisions that were in their interests. Today, we call factions political parties. George Washington himself warned the nation about the dangers of factions in his farewell address. Office Hours with Dr. A, 3 p.m. on Sundays, K98 Talk. We've got something to say to you, America. And it's 3 p.m. Sunday. It's Office Hours with my professor, and here I go. I have questions about his last lecture, and I know he won't be afraid to ask answer them because he's not afraid of much. He landed jets on an aircraft carrier he's a phd in political science so i know he'll have the answers or he'll challenge me to come up with the answers and he might challenge you too dr a lou is that you i'm uh, i'm here in my office for office hours come on in it is me how are you this morning i have questions about your last lecture Okay, uh, I think I might have some answers. Uh, let's kind of uh, regurgitate what we talked about today in class. Uh, wake up, America. I think I got something to say. I love the United States of America. I want you to love the United States of America, too. Now, rest assured, Dr. A will not try to put his brain into your head. I tell my students, any class I teach, any university, I tell them that. Uh, most of the professors nowadays, I'm sure you probably know this, are mega liberal, uh, progressive, which is another word for communist Marxist. And, and unfortunately, that's what's been taking over the United States of America and the educational system and basically infiltrating everywhere into our society. What I will do as a professor, however, is motivate you to think and to use the analytical part of your brain that very few people want to use because why? Because it requires actual effort. It requires actual work. Lou, I'm going to try to make you think. What are, you, what, what are your reaction to that? I like it when you make me think, but I have a lot of questions about communist Marxist cultural Marxism. All right, we're going to talk about that here in a minute. I, I want to, you know what's going on right now in the world? Uh, we got these uh, Black uh, Lives Matter movements and uh, people like Farrakhan saying these insightful things, uh, which t to me are, are causing people to do all sorts of hateful, um, heinous criminal activity, pretty much with impunity. And so I, what it made me think about was uh, my good friend, Lieutenant Colonel Dave Grossman from the Army, uh, taught uh, uh, me something, and I want to pass that on to, to my, uh, my listeners and my students. And, and here's what he taught me. 
honor never grows old and honor rejoices with the heart of age it does so because honor is finally about defending those noble and worthy things that actually deserve defending even if that comes at a high cost now Lou in our time that may mean social disapproval public scorn which I know you've gone through Jared Day has gone through this I'm sure Rick Robinson has and uh, I'm, anytime I you know, am on the air or uh, write an article I get Twitter trolls coming out of the woodwork to you know spew their hate and vitriol at me as does JD and Stacy Lennox and people like that Andrea Kay uh, so it, it might mean hardship it might mean persecution which we can see happening right now people like Kim, Kim Davis uh, persecuted for her Christian beliefs I'll talk about that in a little while too during the show or always it might even mean death so here's what we have to ask ourselves these these questions remain what is actually worth defending what is worth dying for maybe more importantly what is worth living for now in, in our society Lou most people are what I call sheep they're kind gentle productive creatures who can only hurt one another by accident. Now this is true. If you look at statistics, remember that the murder rate in the United States is about six per 100,000 uh, people in the USA. That's, that's per year, six, six per 100,000 per year. And the aggravated assault rate is four per 1,000 per year. What this means is that the vast majority of Americans are not inclined to hurt one another. Some estimates say that 2 million Americans are victims of violent crimes every year. Now, while that's a tragic number, it's a staggering number, it's perhaps an all-time record rate for violent crime. But I think based on the last uh, census, there's about 320 million Americans, which means that the odds of being a victim of a violent crime is considerably less than 1 in 100,000 in any given year. And furthermore, since many violent crimes are committed by repeat offenders, the actual number of violent citizens is considerably less than the two million. So we have a paradox here, and we must be able to analyze and grasp both ends of this paradox. Lou, we may well be in the most violent times in our history, but violence is still remarkably rare. This is because most citizens, again, I reiterate, are kind, decent people who are not capable of hurting each other except by accident or under extreme provocation. Again, they are sheep. Now, I don't mean anything negative by calling people sheep. Uh, to me, a good analogy is uh, it's like the pretty blue robin's egg that I used to crawl up in the trees when I was younger in Connecticut and uh, check the nest out. Inside of that, uh, egg is it's soft and gooey but someday it will grow into something wonderful but the egg cannot survive without its hard blue shell now police officers soldiers uh, EMS first responders other warriors are like that shell and someday the civilization that they protect and defend will grow into something wonderful like the, the blue robin egg for now, though, they need warriors to protect them from, from what? The predators. They're all the wolves in society. And the wolves feed on the sheep without mercy. Lou, here's my first question to you. Do you believe that there are wolves out there in society who will feed on the flock of sheep without mercy? Unfortunately, I think I've voted for some of them. You voted for some? You didn't vote for Obama, did you? No. But he's not the only one. But, yeah, maybe. Definitely I believe it, because I think I may have voted for some of them, unfortunately. Well, here's Dr. A's uh, analysis. You better believe it, sister. <laughs> there are evil men and evil women in this world, and they are capable of evil deeds. I personally believe Mrs. Clinton is an evil, heinous, venomous, poisonous woman. Uh, come on, Dr. A, tell us what you really think. The moment you forget, right. <laughs> the moment you forget that fact or pretend 
that it is not true, you suddenly become a sheep. And you know what, Lou, there is no safety in denial. Then there are the sheepdogs, and I am a sheepdog. I was my entire life as a naval aviator and as a uh, pilot for Homeland Security. As a sheepdog, I live to protect the flock and to confront that wolf. Now, if you have a capacity for violence, then you are a healthy, productive citizen. Also, you're a sheep. If you don't have any capacity for violence, but if you do have a capacity for violence and no empathy for your fellow citizens, you have identified yourself as an aggressive sociopath, a wolf. I wrote an article several months ago about Mrs. Clinton asking the public that read it, is she a, path is she a pathological liar or is she a sociopath? I think the consensus was that she is both. And in my humble opinion, Mrs. Clinton cannot be cured by any pharmaceutical, psychological, or beads and rattles remedy. She is a wolf. What do you think about that analogy? I, I think it's a good analogy. I, I don't think she wants to be cured. I think that she thinks that the rest of us need to be cured. Uh, she's been mind raped from the very beginning when she was at Wellesley and then uh, when she went to law school. Um, so what? where's the lie between a, someone who's mind raped and someone who, who's a mind raper? Boy, the mind raper is just a heinous, vile individual who has uh, designs on using you uh, as the slave and as the vehicle through which they can perpetrate their heinous behavior on the rest of society. And they're out there. They're cultural Marxists. They are Islamists. Uh, I just finished reading uh, Beck's latest book when he talks about that. And you know what? He's right. It is about Islam. I always tell people Islam is not a religion. Islam is a totalitarian political ideology of total, brutal control over human behavior and human thought merely masquerading as religion. If it is a religion at all, it is a religion of constant warfare and conflict. Uh, as such, it is because they try to control your thought process as well as your uh, actual behavior, it is worse than what Tocqueville taught us about uh, in his book when he looked at America, Democracy in America. Uh, he talked about the tyranny of the majority. This is like tyranny of the minority. Small group of people can mind rape other individuals and force them to think a certain way or force them not to think a certain way for their own benefit. And that's, that's worse than tyranny of the majority. It is a big time problem. Now, getting back to what Grossman taught us, what if you have a, a capacity for violence and a deep love for your fellow citizens and your country? What have you got then? Well, you have a sheepdog, a warrior, someone who is walking the hero's path, someone who can walk into the heart of darkness, directly into harm's way, into the universal human phobia, and walk out relatively unscathed. Now, let me expand a little bit on this model of the sheep wolves and sheepdogs. We know that the sheep live in denial. That's pretty much what makes them sheep they do not want to believe that there is evil in this world. It's funny, it's ironic. They can accept the fact that fires can happen, which is why they want fire extinguishers and fire sprinklers and fire alarms and fire exits incorporated throughout their children's schools. But many of them are outraged, indignant at the very idea of putting an armed police officer into that same school that their children attend. You know what, Lou, our children are thousands of times more likely to be killed or seriously injured by school violence than by fire. But the sheep's only response to the possibility of violence is denial. The very idea of someone coming to kill or harm their child is just too hard to accept. And so they close, they, they, they choose the path of refutation the path of least resistance, the path of denial, Lou. What do you think about that? I think denial is a dangerous thing no matter how you apply it. I think when we apply it to the theory 
that you're putting forth as far as sheep, sheep dogs, and wolves, it's extremely dangerous, especially in terms of government, because that, whether we like to realize it or not, they touch everything we do. What's, uh, what's interesting is, that I want to bring this up now, we, you know, I had a conversation offline where I told you today, coming out of the Panera Bread uh, here in Peachtree City, Georgia, I ran into a female cop. She was talking to a couple of people inside, and um, I picked up my bear claw and a cup of coffee and walked out, and uh, I just happened to go walking out the door at the same time she did, so I opened the door for her. I, I am a, a male chauvinist. I believe in opening doors for, for women. Uh, and she walked through, and I walked behind her, and I, I stopped her, and I thank you for her service and I started chit-chatting with her and asked her this question. I said, uh, is there any um, provision in the police department here for volunteers? And I showed her my uh, retired uh, law enforcement uh, Department of Homeland Security ID and the fact that I can carry a gun, you know, that sort of stuff. Uh, and I said, is there anything like that here? She really didn't know. We discussed it for a little while. And then I mentioned that to you, and, and your response to me was uh, quite interesting. Why don't you share that with the listeners, if you would? Dara, I don't remember my response. What did I say? You, you said you didn't like. You just said you didn't like that. You, your mom uh, lived through stuff like that. You don't like the idea, maybe, of, uh, of uh, volunteers being out there for some for some reason. I, that's what you said. Let me no, I don't. I don't dis. Yeah, I don't. I, don't, I, I actually um, do like the idea of of volunteers. Uh, being out there and, and of everybody being vigilant because of the stories that my mother told me about you know growing up the, the share, share one of those stories with us let the, let the listeners hear one of these stories your mom shared with you well she she told me a lot of things some of them I, I probably wouldn't repeat but the um, you know as I was growing up I, I was a child out in the late 60s and early 70s and a lot of things that happened in my small south georgia town were pretty scary as far as uh, riots for such a small town that knew nothing of danger at all um, for riots to come to town it was pretty frightening for the people that were there it made a, a huge impression um, as much as the duck and cover drills of the cold war made on my mother she told me um, stories that were meant to be warnings, really. Um, don't let it happen again or be vigilant if it does happen again. So, it, you know, it was basically stories of people being bussed into town to riot. Right. And it sounds pretty familiar. Yeah, now. Exactly. Mm -hmm. what's, what's going on right now? Right. Uh, are we getting close to a break, or can I continue with my analogy here? Can you continue? You have okay. a you have at least fifteen minutes till a break. Okay, mm -hmm. okay. Um, let's get back to the sheep, wolves, and sheep dogs. Now, the, the sheep uh, in our society, um, generally speaking, they don't like the sheep dogs. Why? Because to them, the sheep dog looks a lot like the wolf. Sheep dog has fangs. Sheep dog has a capacity for violence. There's a big difference, though. The big difference is that the sheepdog must not, cannot, and will not ever, ever harm the sheep. Any sheepdog who intentionally harms the lowliest little lamb of our society will be severely punished and removed. The world can't work any other way, Lou, at least not in our representative constitutional democracy, our republic. Still, the sheepdog disturbs those sheep. The sheepdog is a constant reminder that there are indeed wolves lurking out there in the land. They would prefer that he didn't tell them where to go or give them traffic tickets or stand at the ready in our airports wearing camouflage fatigues holding an M16. The sheep would much rather have the sheepdog cash in his fangs, spray paint himself white, and go, bah. Now, that is until the wolf shows up at their door. But then the entire flock of sheep tries desperately to hide behind one, count them, one lonely sheepdog. Let me give you an example. The students, the, uh, the victims at Columbine High School were big, tough high school students. 
And under ordinary circumstances, they would not have had the time of day for a police officer, for a cop. Now, they were not bad kids. They just had nothing to say to a cop. When the school was under attack, however, and those courageous SWAT teams were clearing the rooms and hallways one by one, the police officers had to physically peel those clinging, sobbing kids off of them. This is how the little lambs feel about their sheepdog when the wolf is banging at their door. Let's remember what happened after September 11, 2001, when that wolf pounded very, very hard on America's door. Do you remember, Lou, how America, more than ever before, felt differently about their law enforcement officers, their firefighters, their military personnel, and their EMS first responders? Can you recall, Lou, how many times you personally heard the word hero back in the vicinity of 911? Can you answer that question for me? No, because it was way too many to count. Okay. So it was more than once? Yes, it was constantly and with good reason. You know, I often, people often ask me about the military, and I spent 20 years in the Navy as a naval aviator, uh, landing jets, attack jets off of four different type of aircraft carriers. And they asked me, uh, we hear that everybody in the military is a hero. That's not true. There, there are some, just like every other aspect, every other um, uh, part of society, there are wonderful, heroic, courageous people uh, in each, each one of these sectors of society. There's also these knuckleheads, uh, that's one term I like to use, knuckleheads, uh, that are not heroes. Um, so just when you hear that, everybody's a hero, please realize that's not absolutely true. You've got to be very careful uh, using that term. Now let me just reiterate here. Please understand, Dr. A, that there is nothing morally superior about being a sheepdog. It is just what you choose to be in life. And also understand this, that a sheepdog is a pretty funny critter. He is always, or she, is always, did you like that, how I went away from my male chauvinist pig for a second there, he, she? Yes, absolutely, because women can be heroes. I, absolutely. I, I, you know, so <laughs> let's, let's stop for a second here. A good friend of mine, one of my squadron mates, is, uh, Vice Admiral John Cotton, when his call sign was Balls, and uh, he ended up, a uh, latter part of his career, as the, uh, he directed, he was in charge of the entire uh, U.S. Navy Reserve Fleet, both uh, the fleet, the aviation, everything. He was in charge of it. He's my squadron mate. And uh, when I was flying, we didn't have any female aviators, none. And then they started slowly uh, working their way into uh, the U.S. Navy. Uh, unfortunately, um, because of people like Pat Schroeder from uh, the Denver district, Congressman Schroeder, and others uh, on the lefty side of the scale continuum, these women were forced on the Navy and they were forced to be successful by these politicians. They, you will have uh, F-14 Tomcat uh, female aviator this year. You will have an A-7 Corsair aviator this year, female. And you know what, Lou, I don't care uh, what color you are, uh, whether you're male or female, if you can meet all those boxes uh, with inside the box of merit, by God, you deserve to be there. Uh, in the beginning, it wasn't that way, and they were kind of forced in there. A lot of my squatter mates would call the women that came through initially a mess in a dress. I mean, no offense by that. But then later on, uh, we started finding out differently. And I asked my, my squatter mates, Admiral Cotton, about that. He said, he said T. Angel, uh, some of these women that are flying, like the F-18s, are shit hot and that's a naval aviation jargon for oh man they are really really good and you know what Lou that made me feel good because I, I want them to be successful I want them to be successful because of their own merit not because some dumbass politician tells me they will be successful this year that is contrived success it never works and you've you said somebody, to me go ahead. you've said to me that it's dangerous when you're talking about naval av aviators and landing jets on aircraft carriers, which makes uh, perfect I, sense. Highly, highly dangerous. I, I, a couple stories. I was a landing signal officer, and uh, that's the, the. I used to think landing signal officers were gods when I was growing up as a student naval aviator because they're the guys that stand on the end of the ship 
with a pickle switch in one <laughs> hand and a microphone uh, uh, up their ear, you know, phone up their ear. They're listening, they're talking, they're directing the landings off of the aircraft carrier, and they are responsible for directing the commanding officer of the carrier for the safe landings and operations around that ship and the air boss as well up in the tower. And so they save your life. And and I was very honored to be one of those, and uh, that that is something I just uh, I will uh, carry to my grave because I just am so happy to be one of those. But we had people that had trouble getting back aboard the carrier. Even the most the most highly decorated naval aviators had trouble getting back aboard. Uh, I remember one year I was waving, and a squadron, uh, a sister squadron mate of mine uh, was also an LSO. He was trying to land on the ship, and he got. A problem with his inner ear, and uh, that will make you start leaning to the left or lean to the right, whichever. And you don't know what's going on because you have that problem uh, with your inner ear, and it happens all the time in aviation. Some of these guys, when they get into the we call it the goo in the clouds. Uh, so I, you know, daytime we almost never say anything. It's always zip lip uh, landing back aboard the ship. Nighttime we do a lot of talking because that's when guys die. So I came up and talked to him, and I said. 401 paddles. That's the name of the LSOs. They uh, call us paddles because in the old days they used paddles. 401 paddles. Go ahead, paddles. Listen to me. I'll get you back aboard. And so you change the whole demeanor uh, of your, your speech and, and you get very empathetic and then you get them back aboard. So you have to pick the best, brightest, most talented individuals because if you crash on an aircraft carrier, Lou, you're not just going to kill yourself. You're going to kill 18 or 20 people standing on that flight deck that are waiting to recover that airplane and keep things operating. So that's why it's very, very uh, difficult to become a tactical naval aviator. And every naval aviator that lands on the ship, every single time, they are being judged and graded by a landing signal officer. And if you can't cut it, they might give you a second chance to get you a little bit more work. But if you can't cut it, you get on the cod and you're home the next day. They get you off of that ship because they have to protect the integrity of the operation. And that's just, that it's very, very, uh, a very, very deadly op uh, uh, occupation. Do you agree with that? Yeah, oh yeah, absolutely. We've talked about this before, and, uh, you know, I think your point was that um, women can cut it, but it's not the women that the bureauc bureaucrats hand you and say this woman will cut it. You have to be able to choose which women can cut it and which ones can't. It's kind of like uh, our uh, tyrant in the White House, uh, Mr. Obama, uh, taking uh, our hard-earned tax dollars uh, and deciding who he thinks is going to be successful and giving gazillions of dollars to Solyndra, who then goes out of business. What happened to our money? <laughs> you see? Right. Government does not pick winners. Government does not create jobs, Lou, except for within their governmental sector. What government is supposed to do, and I teach this to my uh, poli sci uh, 40 class, which is poli sci 101, it's basically the first class in American government. What government is supposed to do, Lou, is to create, and first of all, they give us security, uh, an umbrella of safety and security from both foreign threat and domestic threat. People forget that, domestic threat. That's the only way the United States will ever, ever collapse, is through domestic, heinous, treason and insurrection from within. That's the only way. We will never, ever be defeated by an outside enemy. Trust me, trust, trust Dr. A on this one subject. We will all come together. But domestic insurrection, and Cicero himself warned us about this, you gotta be careful of that because you learn to trust those people. They speak in the same language that you speak, in the same dialect. They're familiar. They roam through the same sectors that you roam through. But then when you turn your back, they stab you. That's the only way the United States will come to an end. And it's happening right now with this infiltration of Islamics, uh, the Islamists and the cultural Marxists. It's happening right now. Let me let me tell you. We we got a break time here. Or we we got a little more time. What? Yeah, this is good. This is a good point for a break. We're gonna just do a really quick station promo and okay. come right back. All right, we'll so, get back to the sheep and sheepdog when we come back. Lead, yeah, Thanks. and lead in with some good music. We'll be right back. Okay.
Red Nation, Nation Rising, Rising brings you Town Hall Radio. Radio. From, a From a single tweet, tweet to three million live, our, our community is a force, force to be reckoned with on social, social media. media. So don't, so don't miss our show Thursdays, Thursdays 8 p.m. Eastern on K98 Talk. Our chat room is our co-host, and you ask the questions. Join us and be heard. So get ready to sound off on Red Nation Rising Radio. No one else is going to do it for you. there from uh, Colonel Dave Grossman. Um, we, we have to understand that this uh, sheepdog, you know, again, what you choose to be in society. A sheepdog is a funny little critter. Uh, he, again, he, she is always sniffing around on, out on the perimeter, uh, checking the breeze, barking at things that go bump in the night, and yearning for that righteous battle. Now that is the young sheepdogs are yearning for a righteous battle. The old sheepdogs, they're a little bit older, a little bit wiser. However, they move to the sound of the guns when needed right along with those young guys. Here's how the sheep and the sheepdog think differently. The sheep pretend the wolf will never come. The sheepdog lives for that very day. Again, after the attacks uh, on the World Trade Center, Pentagon, uh, September 11, 2001, most of the sheep, that is most of the American uh, citizens in our society, said this, thank God I wasn't on one of those planes. The sheepdogs were different. The sheepdogs, the warriors, they said this, dear God, I wish I could have been on one of those planes. Maybe I could have made a difference. When you are truly transformed, Lou, into a warrior and have, have invested yourself wholeheartedly in warriorhood, you want to be there. You want to be able to make the difference that you know you can make. Now again, I reiterate, not, there's nothing morally superior about the sheepdog, the warrior, but he, she does have one real advantage, only one. And that is, he or she is able to survive and thrive in an environment that destroys 98% of the population. There was research conducted several years ago with individuals who were convicted of violent crimes. These convicts were in prison for serious predatory crimes of violence, assaults, murders, and the killing of law enforcement officers. By the way, we've had, I think, uh, we've had 11 of our, of our finest uh, blue thin line warriors, uh, cops, killed in the last 17 days. I think that's about right, 11 in the last 17 days. Uh, God bless them. Um, the, the vast majority of these convicts that were interviewed said that they specifically targeted their victims by body language. What do I mean by that? A slumped walking posture passive behavior and a lack of awareness. In other words, they choose or they chose their victims like the big cats do in Africa when they select one out of the herd that is least able to protect itself. Some people may be destined to be sheep and others might be genetically primed to be wolves or sheepdogs. But I believe that most people can choose which one they want to be. And I'm proud to say, and I'm seeing this more and more, I'm proud to say that more and more Americans are choosing to become sheepdogs. Seven months after the attack on September 11th, uh, 2001, Todd Beamer was honored in his hometown of Cranberry, New Jersey. Mr. Beamer, as you recall, was the man on Flight 93 over Pennsylvania who called on 
his cell phone to alert an operator from United Airlines about the hijacking that was going on on his plane. When he learned from her that there were three other passenger uh, airliners that had been used as weapons against America, Todd dropped his phone and uttered these famous words, let's roll. Now, authorities believe that this was a signal to the other passengers to confront the terrorist hijackers on their plane. So what happened here, Lou? In one hour, a transformation occurred among those passengers, athletes, business people, mothers and fathers on that airplane. They went, they made the transition from sheep to sheep dogs, and together they, they fought those wolves valiantly. Edmund Burke wrote Reflections of the French Revolution. I think it was called Reflections of the Revolution in France, the actual title. In that work, he taught us that there is no safety. Listen to me, there is no safety, Lou, for honest men and women, except by believing all possible evil and heinousness from evil men. And one, one author I quote often because she was uh, an author who talked a lot about totalitarianism, Hannah Arndt taught us that the more heinous the behavior is, l listen to me, the more heinous the behavior is, the easier it is for the rest of us to believe that it never actually happened. She wrote that in The Origins of Totalitarianism. Why would one human being put another human being in an oven and, and, and cook them. I, you know, that, to me, is just unfathomable, but we know that it happened. What do you think about that, Lou? Well, it not only happened, it happened in mobs. Yeah. Um, so it's, you know, it, it's, it's even more unfathomable, not just that one person would do it, but that they can, could convince hundreds what? of thousands or, or millions of people to go along with them. Right. Let's let's come to a more uh, contemporary uh, some contemporary examples. What type of human being would cut another human being's head off? What type of human being would put men in a cage and lower that with no possibility of escape and lower that cage into a lake to drown them? What type of man would throw another man, uh, an alleged homosexual, off of a two-story building to kill them? What type of a man would hang another man up uh, by his legs and hands upside down with his face and body facing the ground and then light fires underneath that man to burn them alive? I can't even fathom that that's possible. What type of individual in a butcher shop that they call Planned Parenthood would, would take a baby at nine months old during a partial birth abortion and keep that baby's heart beating once it's outside the womb just so they can have fresher organs, baby organs, to sell on the open market. I remember when I was at UCLA, I had students because I happen to be very dramatic when I give lectures uh, that would say, Dr. A, you, you need to run for political office. And I flirted with that idea. I, I'm still thinking about it, the possibility. We'll see what happens. But So I said, okay, fine. Let's tell you what. Let's... Uh, Next class, I won't give a lecture, but what we'll do is we'll pretend that I'm a candidate running for the, uh, the House seat in this district, and you guys are going to come to my uh, little conference, news conference, and ask me questions. So they did. And uh, I, I played the role to the T, and they, they would ask me questions. And one of the questions they asked me, and this was several years ago, Lou, they asked me, Dr. A, what is your opinion on abortion? And back then, we're talking about 2008, 2007, Back then, I said this, well, I, uh, I'm sort of on the fence about abortion. I, I really don't want to tell a woman what she must do with her body. It's really none of my business. I, I don't want to tell her that. And yet, I do have, uh, I am a Christian, I do have empathy for that, that baby inside of the, the mother's womb. Uh, I know that uh, we were, God himself said, hey, I knew you before you were even in that womb. I know every, every hair in your head. So back then, I said, I, I think I would be pro-choice, but I would hope the choice would be for life. And you know what, Lou? That was until I saw a video of a partial birth abortion. It disgusted me. I have to watch these so that I can be 
uh, educated on them and it can talk to uh, an, an audience, whether that's on the air and during the interview or this show or to students or anybody that I speak to. I have to see this stuff. I don't want to. When I saw that partial birth abortion, at that second, I was pro-life and I'll never ever be off that, on that fence again. That baby is a baby when it's first conceived. What do you think about that position? I, I think that you make a wonderful point about you know, my generation and the generation after me of women who were <clears throat> probably in that same boat, in that same way of thinking, and very much fooled by the industry of abortion as far as, I mean, you know, their, their propaganda and, they, you know, how we were lied to. Basically. It's just a mass of cells. It's a clump of goo. And you know what I heard the other day? That a lot of these so-called counselors at Planned Parenthood are convincing these young girls to keep that baby for a longer period of time. Let's do the abortion at the seventh or eighth month because they get better organs to it with which they can barter on the open market uh, and buy their fancy uh, you know, sports car. That sort of stuff just makes me sick. And I see it all the time on, on Twitter. I know uh, uh, Stacey Lennox, I call her the Cornell chick. Stacey Lennox, uh, your dear friend, is always talking about that. And she gets excoriated when she brings that up. And, of course, then we have to come to her defense, uh, you and me and J.D. and the rest of these people, Rick and... Uh, Stacy is Hunter one of those... Yeah, Stacy is one of those people that will speak the truth and endure the consequences. Where did you learn that from? Speak the truth and endure the consequences. <laughs> Who taught you that? I'm relating that to, to what you have taught me. Yeah, definitely. It's your favorite saying, and she is definitely one of those people. Well, uh, I'm, I'm uh, happy to uh, uh, know her, and uh, she's going to buy me that dinner when... Uh, when what happens before March twenty? Yeah, happens. I don't know. I think that she might actually win that bet, but we won't. We won't talk about that because I want to see um, nothing more than a pantsuit turned to an orange jumpsuit. Well, we, we I'm, we're going to get to Mrs. Clinton here in a minute. Let me, <laughs> let, me, let me go back to the point here that I was emphasizing. All right. <laughs> uh, about sheep, sheep, dogs, and wolves. Here's the point, and I, I like to emphasize this, especially to the. Uh, hundreds of thousands of police officers, uh, soldiers, university students that I've spoken to over the years. In nature, we're talking about real nature, the sheep, the real sheep are born as sheep. Sheep dogs are born that way too and so are the wolves. They didn't have a choice, Lou, but you are not a critter. If anybody's out there listening, you are not a critter. As a human being, you can be whatever you want to be, dude or dudette. It's a conscious... That was my Southern California surfer boy coming out of me. You realize I, I came from Southern California. Yes. I, I'm not USC. I can't stand USC. Uh, UCLA boy. Um, as a human being, you can be whatever you want to be. It is a conscious moral decision. You know what? If you want to be a sheep, then you can be a sheep. And that's okay. But you must understand the price that you might pay. When the wolf comes knocking on your door, you and your loved ones are going to die if there is not a sheepdog there to protect and defend you. If you want to be a wolf, you can be one. But we sheepdogs are going to hunt you down, and you will never, ever have rest, never have safety or security, never have trust, never have love. But if you want to be a sheepdog and you want to walk that warrior's path, male or female, then you must make a conscious and moral decision every day to dedicate, equip, and prepare yourself to thrive and survive in that toxic, corrosive moment when the wolf comes knocking at your door. For example, uh, maybe you don't know this, Lou. You're a church-going girl. Many women, excuse me, <laughs> my, uh, my sexist, my male chauvinist pig coming Hey, it's me. in my Twitter profile. It says girl. I, you know, <laughs> do you really wear those ugly high heels? Please say no. <laughs> they were a gift from our station manager. Rick Robinson gave you those? Well, oh he, uh, he gave me the photo. He passed them back after he hey, subbed for me. Hey, 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 wait a minute. 
I've never gotten a gift from Rick Robinson. Well, maybe well, he'll like, send well, you. What a, am I doing wrong? Maybe he'll send you an avatar photo. Oh, okay. All right. Uh, okay. Um, now let's get back to this. For example, many police officers carry their concealed weapons in church. They are concealed in ankle holsters or shoulder holsters under their suit coat or inside the belt holsters that are tucked into the small of their backs and their, and their pants. Lou, anytime you go to some form of religious service, there is a very good chance, a very good likelihood that a police officer in your congregation is packing heat, carrying a weapon. And you will never know if there is such an individual in your place of worship until the wolf appears there to massacre you and your loved ones. I was trained several years ago. I was training a group of police officers in Texas. By the way, I'm an honorary Texan. I've been given that honor by Red Nation Rising Texas. Thank you, ma'am. <laughs> I have my friends here that say, no, 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 you're not an honorary Texan. You're from Southern California. It's uh, au contraire. I have the proof, proof to, to show you that I'm honorary Texan. You know what? I've lived in more, more cities in Texas than my friends here in, that are Texans that live in Peachtree City. I've lived in more cities than they have. So you bet your butt I'm an honorary Texan. <laughs> Everybody but wants to be an honorary Texan. Ah, it just drives me wild. That's <laughs> I, can take, I can take the hazing. Um, I was training a group of pol uh, police officers in Texas, and during one of the breaks, one officer, I was overhearing this, one officer asked his friend if he carried his weapon to church. The, the other cop replied to this question, I will never be caught without my weapon in church. When he, they separated, I asked him, why did he feel so strongly about this? And he told me about a cop he knew who was at a church massacre in Fort Worth, Texas in 1999. Of course, more recently, I think it was in June of this year, Dylan Roof walked into a, a church there. I think, most, I think it was a black church, for lack of a better way to put that. Mostly black people uh, yeah. in that wonderful church. Uh, it was, I think it was Charleston, South Carolina, and he, he killed like nine people. It was. It was in the AME church in Charleston, uh, North, South Carolina. And historically, um, the the AME churches just, you know, as a side note, have historically been the um, bridge between yeah. the races in the South. And I think that was really his problem with the AME church and with that mother church is that they have been a bridge. That. Yeah. They, in my community where I grew up in South Georgia, they were very much a bridge between the black community and the white community. So Charleston, is that North Carolina? It is. South Carolina? Oh, oh stop it. It's South Carolina. It's South Carolina. <laughs> you know it's South Carolina, and you know there's a difference. Do they do they actually have football teams and athletics up in the Carolinas? I don't really recall any athletic uh, activity up there. Can you? Sigh. Yes, <laughs> we do. do ask this, question. this is for the entertainment value of uh, our uh, one listener. Um, <laughs> do, you, do you know which university has won more NCAA titles than any other university, hands down? Let me just give you a clue. It's UCLA. Not North Carolina or North Carolina State. A lot of respect for those guys, especially Jim, Jim Valvano and those people up there, but it's UCLA, my alma mater. And yeah, I I'm going to act and, like you've never told me that before, no, like, a hundred times. Maybe, maybe Rick didn't know that. I was trying to tell him. And he's gone. <laughs> he's left. I must have offended him. He's, out of, he's not in the romper room. The only one in the romper room right now for Dr. A, well, Office Hours Dr. A, is Dr. A. Oh, my goodness. No, I'm in there. Rick's in there. Uh, <laughs> But that's not what imp what's important, Doc. You have something to say, oh, oh, and okay. and that's, if there isn't, nice. if there are people listening, they're probably really uh, listening with bated breath at this point. For are us. they incensed that I'm uh, touting my UCLA? Oh man! No, right, probably let's, let's, not. Let's, let's, <laughs> let's, they won yesterday, by the way. They beat Virginia. Uh, by the way, uh, in that 1999 incident in Fort Worth. Very similar to what happened uh, up in the Charleston, South Carolina, AME Church. A mentally deranged individual came in, burst into that church, and opened fire, gunning down 14 people. He said that officer believed he could have saved every single last one of those lives that day if he had been carrying his gun. His own son, Lou, was shot, and all he could do was throw his body onto his son's body and wait to die. I heard him say that. That cop looked me straight in the eye and said, do you have any idea 
Dr. A, how hard it would be to live with yourself after that episode took place. Some individuals would be horrified, probably the lefties. I call them lefties, no offense intended. Some individuals would be horrified if they knew this police officer was carrying a weapon into their worship service at church. They might call him paranoid and would probably publicly scorn him like a lot of people do you. And Jared, but those those people are from uh, Putin's army, right? I don't know. So former yeah, Soviet. I'm always catching uh, Twitter trolls from Putin's army, but uh, the, the you can always tell who they are because the minute you call them out, they disappear. Oh, yeah. Well, I've got I've got some Twitter trolls that just excoriate me, and uh, I'm kind of sensitive. Well, no, I'm not. I'm naval aviator. Bring it on, folks. Come on. You're not sensitive to anything. Don't no, <laughs> don't pull my leg, Doc. I know better than that. Bring it on. <laughs> y- yet these same individuals would be enraged and would call for heads to roll if they discovered that the airbags in their car were defective, which just happened in Toyota, or that the fire extinguisher and the fire sprinklers or the fire exits exit at their church, their kid's school uh, house did not work, they would be enraged. Heads will roll. These people can accept the fact that fires happen, traffic accidents can happen, and that there must indeed be safeguards within our society against that from happening. But their only response to the wolf is denial. And all too often the response to the sheepdog is scorn and disdain. But the sheepdog quietly asks himself or herself, do you have any idea how hard it would be to live with yourself if your loved ones or your friends or your fellow citizens black or white Hispanic I don't care fellow citizens were attacked gunned down and brutally murdered and you had to stand there helplessly because you were unprepared for that day as a sheepdog in the end it is denial that turns people into sheep The sheep are psychologically destroyed by combat because their only defense is denial, which is counterproductive. It's also destructive, resulting in emotions of fear, helplessness, and sheer terror and horror when that wolf shows up. And you know what, Lou? Denial kills you twice. It kills you once at your moment of truth when you are not physically prepared. You didn't bring your gun or you didn't train to be prepared. Your only defense was wishful thinking. But you know what? Hope, despite what Mr. Obama teaches his psycho fans, hope is not a strategy. Denial kills you a second time, Lou, because even if you do physically survive, You are psychologically shattered by your fear, your helplessness, and your horror at your moment of truth. Gavin De Becker puts it like this in his his, his book called Fearless. Fearless, it's a superb 9-11, post-9-11 book, which probably should be required reading for anyone trying to come to terms with our current world situation. This is what he said, denial can be seductive but it has an insidious effect. For all the peace of mind deniers think they get by saying it isn't so. Remember I wrote that article, say it ain't so, Joe? Well, it's so. For all the peace of mind that these deniers think they get by saying it isn't so, the fall they take when faced with new violence is all the more unsettling. In fact, Here's, here's my analysis. Denial is a save now, pay me later scheme. A contract written entirely in small print. Because in the long run, the, the denying person knows the truth on some level. I truly believe there are many, many people out there that are mind raped by communist political professors, political activists, family members, religious members, 
uh, all sorts of people out there that are, are mind raping individuals. And I think some of these, you ask me the difference between mind rapers and, and those that have been mind raped. I think a lot of these mind rapers know the truth on some gut level, but they're so invested in their progressive communist uh, ideology. And it's, it's the source of their power. They cannot, they will not, they must not ever give it up because then they are insignificant. One day, Mrs. Clinton and Mrs. Weiner are going to have to give up their lives and they'll no longer have any kind of influence whatsoever on our society. Trust me, that is going to happen one day. The same with Mr. Clinton. Uh, hopefully that'll happen with uh, Mr. and Mrs. Obama one day. We'll see. Um, hopefully, but I don't think that uh, Huma goes by Mrs. Weiner. I like that. I like to call Uma Mrs. Weiner. I like to call Hillary Mrs. Clinton. Uh, I'm I'm old, I'm 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 old school on that, and uh, I think that you get married, she takes your name. I'm sorry. I am a. I guess I'm a male chauvinist. I don't hey, know. I did. All you people out there listening, your Twitter, uh, your Twitter trolls of Dr. A, get, bring it on. Call me with sexist. Uh, Whatever you want to call me. I, I, I had a choice, and I chose to do it, and nobody cared whether I did got, or I did it. six or seven names, and your husband, wonderful husband that he is, he took you out, I guess, uh, Friday night for a wonderful date somewhere, and I'm glad you guys got to do that. You need you need a break, too, as does Rick Robinson. He works like seven days a week. Yeah, Rick works eight days a week, I think, does he not? I, if there were eight days, days in the week, Rick would work them, yes. Ugh. Okay. Yeah. Well, let's get back to this now. Now, this denial uh, is a save now, pay me later um, scheme. Some level they know the truth. So the warrior must strive to confront denial constantly, combat denial in all aspects of his or her life, and prepare themselves for the day when evil comes. And trust me, evil's going to come. If you are a warrior who is legally authorized to carry a weapon and you step outside of your home without that weapon, you've just become a sheep pretending that the bad man, bad woman, will not come today. Now, listen to me. No one can be, how should I put this, on. Nobody can be on for 24-7 for an entire lifetime. Everyone needs some downtime like we just said Rick needs some downtime. Stacy and JD need some downtime. Um... Andrea came, my, my friend in San Diego, needs some downtime. But if you are authorized to carry a weapon and you walk outside without that weapon, just take, here's my advice to you. Just take a deep breath and think to yourself and say, bah. Remember, the business of being a sheep or a sheep dog is not a yes, no dichotomy. It's not an all or nothing, uh, either or choice. It's a matter of degrees in the continuum. On the one end is an abject, head in the sand sheep, and we have many of them, Lou. Those are the mind rapes people. And on the other end is the ultimate warrior, the Chris Kyles out there. Few people exist completely on one end or the other. Most of us, like all of life, live somewhere in between. I was once taught by a good friend of mine, uh, Earl Primo. He's probably one of the, the, the most brilliant humorous, funny people in the world. He's an Italian like Harry. He said, he said, Randy, the truth is always somewhere in the middle. And that's probably pretty true when you have people talking about things, especially in, in a legal sense. Most of us live somewhere in between. Since 911, I'm happy to say, I'm seeing this more and more because of what's happening right now with cultural Marxist infiltrators and the Islamist threat, this caliphate that exists in, in uh, Syria and in Iraq. Since that's occurring, almost everyone, almost everyone in America seems to have taken a step up that continuum away from denial. Not everybody, but there's a fair amount of people that are doing that. The sheep took a few steps toward accepting and appreciating their warriors, and the warriors started taking their jobs more seriously on a day-to-day -day basis. Now, the, the degree to which you personally move up that continuum away from denial, away from sheephood, is the degree, Lou, to which you and your loved ones will survive physically, emotionally, and psychologically at your moment of truth. And today, again, to reiterate, in contemporary America, the dire threats have been multiplied by Al-Qaeda, ISIS, cultural Marxism, those Islamists, 
who I'm sad to say are operating at near impunity with Barack Obama in the White House. So here's my tantalizing question, my provocative question for you, America, from, from straight from Dr. A. What's it gonna be, ladies and gentlemen, for you in America? Sheep, wolf, or sheepdog? What's it gonna be for you, Lou? Answer that question for the listeners. We've already decided that I'm a sheepdog. I'm not Can blocked. Can we lose you, Lou? Yeah, sorry for a second there you did. We've already decided that I'm a sheepdog, right? So, Can you lose me? I, well, I don't, I tend to not follow. I certainly lead. I'm not afraid to take a bullet. I might not carry a gun. <laughs> I'm not going to shoot you, but I will probably stand between you and someone you are going to shoot and take a bullet for them. That's okay. just who I am. If a uh, building's on fire, you know, and there's nobody else around to go in and, and grab the dog, I might be the one to go in and grab the dog. That's just who I am. I don't, but and, and I think that it's innate. But then again, I think that uh, no matter who you are, that you can work toward that it is a conscious decision. I think that, you know, maybe to an extent we're raised that way, right? So my father is definitely a sheepdog. Maybe he Excellent. made me a sheepdog. Excellent. Excellent. How about Harry? Oh, Harry's a... I, he's somewhere between a wolf and a sheepdog. No, he's a, <laughs> he's a sheepdog. <laughs> how do you characterize uh, that uh, Cornell chick, Stacey Lennox, and uh, and her sidekick uh, JD? She's the well. They're I, they're both definitely sheepdogs, and um, you can you can watch Stacey's interaction with. Uh, her friends and the way that that she protects people. She's the um, she's the mama sheepdog. Here's, here's my question Same before we go your next break, which I'm sure we're getting close to. Yes. What are you gonna do as a sheepdog? You 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 tell me you self-identify as a sheepdog. <laughs> what are you gonna do um, to convince some of these sheep to be a little bit more like a sheepdog? What are you gonna do? How do you convince them? Uh, well, hey, we could coin a new term here and call it sheep shaming, since there's dog shaming and there's, you know, fat shaming and there's all kind of shamings these sheep, days. Sheep, sheep shanking, I like that, sheep shanking. Sheep shaming, so shame, shaking, sh shame, uh, shame the sheep into being sheep dogs. By the way, that's a word you never had, you were never allowed to use that word on a golf course, shank. Uh, <laughs> right, exactly. exactly. But... Yeah, I mean, I, I think that, I think people are waking up, and I think the more that they wake up, the more they become sheep dogs instead of sheep, don't you think? Because part of being a sheep is being blind. Well, I, I think they are, and I, I think uh, in the uh, Republican Party, which we have, uh, I used to teach the uh, political parties class, uh, we've got three entities within the political parties. Uh, we've got the grassroots level which is the vast majority of the people in, that identify with the, whatever political party they identify with. We have the elected officials in office, and then we have the organization. And right now in the Republican Party, you've got a big problem with uh, power. Power corrupts. All power corrupts. Absolute power corrupts. Absolutely. And these, and I wrote about this in the Invisible Primary. Maybe we'll talk about that one of the shows uh, coming up next week or week after the invisible primary they've already decided who they want they don't want uh like you and stacy they, they don't want uh, mr trump they, they they want uh hillary clinton mrs clinton and the, the jebster that's what they've banked on and they don't want to upset the boat they don't want to be a road a boat rocker uh, upset the cart uh, they want they think they want to be in the middle and that attracts more voters. Nothing could be further from the truth, Lou. Nothing. It took Ronald Reagan 20 years to finally get elected. Of course, we know where he was on the political continuum. After he flirted with the, you know, the Democratic Party, he became a staunch, do conservative. He talked it, and he walked it, and he did it. And he won uh, two elections, made some mistakes, don't know, no doubt about it. We're all flawed men and women. But uh, one of the best presidents we've ever had and uh, we need to get back to that and find out during this vetting process who was going to be 
uh, the most conservative individual and will not just talk that game but actually do that once they get in the office uh, both on both sides of Capitol Hill in the House and in the Senate and at uh, 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. That's the problem we have right now. Uh, we've got to overcome these so-called political elites, Lou. What do you think about that? I think they're wolves. I think the political elites are the wolves that we were talking about. Some others may be sheepdog, sheepdogs. You know, I'm not sure that Trump is the sheepdog, but there, there has to be out of 16 or 17 candidates. There's got to be a sheepdog in there. What somewhere, right? But I don't well, think I, there that are, there, too, there are several. Nothing is universal. But the, these right. uh, people in the uh, establishment are cowards. I, I'm sorry, they're cowards. And I've already told you about my analysis of the Trump candidacy. I'm, you know, I, I, every time I get during an interview, the interviewee asks me who I'm endorsing for president. I said, look, it's way too soon. Way too early. Yeah. So, I like every one of them compared to Mrs. Clinton. Absolutely. Yeah. Let's but, but, let's but, play our our uh, halftime break real quick, uh, and let's come when we come back. Let's talk about those uh, the presidential candidates and wolves and sheep and sheepdogs. Okay. You want to? Do. Okay. Yes, we will. We'll cut the break real quick, and we'll be back in about two and a half. Tune into Tune America, America Off the Rails, Rails with, Rowdy with Rowdy Rick Robinson, Robinson every, Saturday every Saturday at 7.30 a.m. Central Daylight Time on iHeartRadio, K98Talk.com, and Blog Talk Radio. Rick, a conservative who's not afraid to say what's on his mind, tackles the issues that threaten to derail our nation. So join him every Saturday morning at 7.30 to get your daily dose of the truth as he tries to keep America from coming off the rails. In these uncertain economic times, you've got to do whatever you can to save money. One of our biggest expenses can be our cars, especially when unexpected repair bills hit. Not anymore. If you own a vehicle with less than 130,000 miles, is less than 12 years old, has a warranty about to expire, or even no warranty at all, you could stop paying for car repairs. Roadside assistance, towing, and rental coverage are all included. Don't wait for the next repair. Make one free call right now to see if you qualify. If your vehicle is less than 12 years old, has less than 130,000 miles, even if it's out of warranty, paying for car repairs can become a thing of the past. Call us right now and get your car protected before your next repair bill hits. Get protection and no more repair bills. Call 800-696-1030. Again, 800-696-1030. That's 800-696-1030. 800-696-1030. Joe had huge problems with the IRS. I knew it was coming. I hadn't filed taxes since 1990. All the IRS letters coming in added up to a nightmare. They got up to like $68,000. My heart started beating fast. It's like, there's no way, man. I mean, I ain't going to be able to do this. Then they stopped his paycheck. So that's when I started making phone calls and found U.S. Tax Shield. U.S. Tax Shield went to work immediately. They just took the bull by the horns. What blew my mind is he called the IRS right then and there. So why is U.S. Tax Shield A plus rated with the Better Business Bureau? Joe knows. They saved me a ridiculous amount of money. If you owe more than ten thousand dollars to the IRS or state, choose the company Joe chose. U.S. Tax Shield. It was the best decision I made. U.S. Tax Shield is the way to go. Life is good. Thank you, Lord. <laughs> Call eight hundred four seven one thirty two eighty seven. U.S. Tax Shield. Boo raw. Yes. <laughs> 800-471-3287. All right, Dr. A, we're back. So let me uh, let me uh, tell you something I teach all my students. A lot of people think we have a democracy in the United States. Absolutely not. Democracy is mob rule. Uh, democracy is something that Aristotle taught us uh, eventually, when enough people within the electorate realize that they can vote themselves a significant portion of the national treasury just by picking a demagogue who will give them that piece of the treasury just by you know in exchange for their vote, uh, you quickly uh, leave democracy and become uh, a tyranny. Uh, first, an anarchy, chaos reigns, anarchy, and then you have tyranny. Um, we in the United States have an oligarchy. Yes, it is a constitutional republic based on democratic principles, but 
it is an oligarchy, and that's sort of one of the underlying themes of the invisible primary that I wrote uh, a few months ago. Uh, oligarchy is a form of government in which all the power is vested in a few people or in a dominant class or clique. Uh, as such, it is governed by the few. It is controlled by the few. It is an aristocracy. Now, whenever I teach a, a class uh, above the, the introductory level in political science, uh, I would have students read a book by C. Wright Mills. Uh, it was his seminal work. It was called The Power Elite. In this book, Mills identified a small, close-knit uh, clique of people that dominates and rules American society. He called it a hereditary uh, nobility. Uh, the power elite, in his definition, is the upper crust alliance of people in government, um, corporations, and in the military, that little triumvirate. And as such, these people are perceived by everybody else and themselves to be the center of wealth and the center of power in the United States. These members of the power elite, they know each other very well. See, Stephen, this sounds familiar. They know each other very well. They're members of the same clubs. They attend the same universities. They sit on the same boards of directors. They drink cocktails at the same fancy nightclubs and, and restaurants uh, within the Beltway, Washington, D.C. Their children intermarry uh, with other power elite members uh, in this power elite structure. And they have the same ultimate goal, Lou, power retention. So while most Americans are taught to believe that we are a society that's governed by this constitutional republic based upon democratic principles, we're actually fooling ourselves. We are actually an oligarchy, an aristocracy that self-identifies as a democratic constitutional republic. This self-identification is perpetuated merely to fool or assuage citizens into believing that they possess the ultimate power over the oligarchs. But in reality, we the people have very little influence over the power elite's behavior. More often than not, Lou, these oligarchs are the puppet masters, and we are the puppets in a marionette show called the United States of America. What do you think about that? I, I, I think it's absolutely accurate. I wonder how many people actually realize that, um, especially with some of the things that are are done and some of the things that people say and you know my Facebook feed sometimes just makes me want to pull my hair out yeah um, the unfollow feature is my favorite feature because I love these people they're my, truly my friends my real friends but they're cheap they buy what they're told hook line and sinker and you know, crazy things, crazy things. You know, like Bernie Sanders is going to make America a better place. Oh, we're Bernie By Sanders is a communist, and it will not make America a better place. Socialism, Lou, only works in two places. So when I say socialism, think communism, think progressivism, all these different monikers, these euphemisms. Socialism <laughs> only works in two places. In a faculty lounge where fools dream of it, and in hell, where the condemned already have it. That's the only two places socialism works. And you know, the concept of the concept of socialism in hell, I think, is a really interesting one. If elaborate on that. Well, socialism. We're so we're supposed to uh, believe that if we have no private property and collective ownership of everything, that we'll have utopia on earth because. Oppression and alienation comes from private property ownership and who owns the means of production. Marx said that we have to have collective ownership of the means of production. And then once we do that, the alienation that the proletariat feels from these evil corporatists and these evil owners of the means of production and the oppression that they forced on, on people will go away because nobody owns private property anymore. Well, that's the problem right there initially because you don't own private property and because you get the same it's from those according to their ability to those according to their need because you can sit on your rear end on your porch and maybe go play tennis every now and then during the day or you and your husband going to work working 12 14 hours really hard like rick robinson does and you get the same amount of the fruits of your labor the fruits of the national treasury it takes away innovation 
It takes away your desire to go out and be something because you didn't get anything extra for it. Yes, greed is involved. And, and greed is absolutely, absolutely a good thing because it forces people to do things that maybe they wouldn't normally do. And that's where we get all these wonderful innovations out of society. Socialism never, ever works. And I wish people would, would understand that. You know, dude, people talk about democracy, pure democracy. The, the book definition is a form of government, which is the supreme power, of course, is vested in the people and is exercised directly by them. The ancient Greeks, in their city-states, small enclaves, uh, practiced something close to pure democracy in those city-states. But political philosophers like Aristotle and Rousseau taught us that representative democracy is nothing more than it's tantamount to mob rule. And they argued that representative democracy gives, gives away individual sovereignty, creating that oligarchy that we just talked about. And that it eventually is transformed into anarchy, then tyranny, again soon after these people realize, hey, all I gotta do is be a slave, and every two years I vote for this guy or that guy from this political party, and I get, get my life given to me while I sit back and do nothing. I vote for this one demagogue every couple of years. That's the problem. <laughs> In the United States, Lou, we have a constitution. It, it used to be revered. It still is revered by Dr. A. Uh, it's, it's a brilliant piece of work that was designed to prevent tyranny, designed to prevent anarchy. The constitution of the United States serves the basic law of the land. It prescribes for us the behavior that all of us must abide by within civil society. Again, it was created, designed to prevent that anarchy that, that is the problem we all face in a political society. I was asked the other day, what's the difference between Locke and Hobbes, your, your uh, hero Locke, and in the state of nature, uh, these, uh, con these social contract theorists, which is what they're lumped, in, uh, lumped underneath in political science, Hobbes wrote this book called The Leviathan, Leviathan which is another word for huge controlling government. And he said, he argued that life is nasty, brutish, and short. That doesn't describe my life, but maybe describe people's lives uh, back there in the state of nature. And he said it was a war. In the state of nature, it was a war of everybody against everybody else. So the problem for, for Hobbes was that in the state of nature, Everybody in mankind was, the problem for him was equality. Did you ever hear that before? The problem was equality? The problem was that each individual was equal enough within the state of nature that under the right set of circumstances, the weakest individual, under that, that right set of circumstances, the weakest individual could kill the strongest individual. Samson and Delilah sort of sort of uh, David and Goli yeah David and Goliath kind of thing yeah so he he <laughs> said what we have to do is devise this this huge government of control to keep everybody safely apart Locke came along and said uh, no 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 first of all divine right does not work there's no such thing as divine right the king said that you are the I mean, the, the uh, king himself God himself said tapped you on the shoulder and said, you can rule England by divine right. That's just ridiculous. He said, it's not about divine right. It's about consent of the governed. And that was revolutionary when he wrote uh, his two treatises on government. His first treatise was religious and the second treatise was governmental politics. He said, what we need to do is bring everybody fruitfully together to form a more perfect society. And he was the first one that said, you know what? I can, I can legitimize revolution for you because what we do is we come together, form this government based on consent of the governed. We give you, we, we loan you the power. We retain ultimate power, the people, but we're going to loan you the power. As long as you do what you're, we want you to do, do things properly, we're going to keep you there. If not, then it's our right. It's not only our right, Lou, it's our obligation to get rid of you by whatever means necessary. He also taught us about the wolves, sheep, dogs, and sheeps. If somebody identifies themselves as an enemy of mankind, every other man and woman has the right and the obligation to get rid of you by whatever means necessary. The democratic principles that we operate under uh, in our 
constitutional republic, of course, are frequent, free, and honest elections uh, that we select our designated representatives who are actually supposed to represent and promote our public policy desires in the governing process. The influence, Lou, is supposed to be what I call non-recursive, uh, meaning that the influence traverses in both directions between us as citizens in the grassroots level and those elected government officials. Now, all of our founding fathers were afraid, wary of unrestrained political power because that creates despotism. They were all too familiar with King George III style of tyranny. And again, I've said this before to you, the biggest threat in those days was from factions seizing control of the government apparatus and making decisions that were in their interests not in the interests of the fledgling nation itself today you know what we call factions Lou political, political parties. parties yeah political parties tax lobbyists George Washington himself father of our country warned us the nation about the inherent dangers of factions in his farewell address. Student Lou, what do you think of that? Well, I think that George Washington was a really smart man, and I think that we should listen to him. I, I know that um, we have a two-party system for a reason, and I know it's kept our Constitution strong for as long as it has. But I think that they never really intended us for us to have the same two political parties for over 150 years. Well, you're, you're going to have um, only two political parties in the United States. You can't have uh, any viable, really viable third party because we don't have, our election rules are proportional representation, or not, not proportional representation, are uh, pluralist in nature, single member districts. If you have proportional representation, then you can have multiple parties, three, four, five, six, whatever, because it would make it worth the time and the effort uh, and the money that you would expend to get just one seat in the House of Representatives. It's not worth it when you have single member districts. So we're always going to have uh, just two political parties. Uh, and we always have had two political parties. But We've lost political parties. The Whigs went away in 1860 when uh, the Republicans uh, were the burgeoning political party. They, they nominated Abraham Lincoln. The Whigs went bye-bye as a political party. Then we have the GOP, the Grand Old Party. That could happen in the United States. It could be that one day the Tea Party or whatever name you want to moniker you want to come up with might replace the Republican Party because they're not serving the people. And one day, I also think, if we can uh, convince and educate enough of these mind-raped individuals within that Democratic Party, which is nothing but a, a completely socialist party now, communist party, that the, the communists in that uh, political party are not doing them any favors. It's like uh, a doctor keeping you sick just so they can make more money off of you coming to visit them and, and uh, giving you the types of... Uh, remedies from the pharma pharmaceutical companies they want to give you that don't cure you. They, they might uh, be a salve, but they don't cure you. That's exactly what's happening right now uh, with the Democrats. They, we've had the war on poverty since 1964 when uh, LBJ was president. Poverty's worse now than it ever has been. Worse now than it ever has been, especially with Barack Obama in the White House. More people now, many more people now, are living in poverty, don't have a job, stop looking for a job, are on food stamps. Because that's what he wants to happen. He believes, he's a communist, as I call him, the Islamic communist. He believes in the Cloward and Piven and Saul Alinsky method uh, of destroying the country. It's a cultural phenomenon. And he thinks if he can bankrupt the country, that they'll be more ripe for the eventual communist revolution. I'm sorry if you disagree with me when I say that, people out there, but it's absolutely true, and I will endure your consequences when you come at me and attack me. Well, I don't know how... Um blind or sheepish you actually have to be to look and there's one or two things so you think if you think the man is smart then he's doing what he thinks he's doing what he's doing intentionally so people think that he's so brilliant people that support him think that he's so brilliant then if he's that brilliant a he would have either fixed us 
or broken us even worse and he's broken us even worse therefore he's done it on purpose if he's really that smart Mr. Obama is a C minus or D plus student at best trust me on this one <laughs> subject and uh, eventually the truth is going to emerge and people are going to find out that he was indeed the uh, quintessential example of a candidate that I call a Manchurian candidate. Yeah. Uh, you, when you judge him, we've discussed this offline before, people will always come to me and say, Dr. Ray, he's incompetent. That depends on the perspective or the political context from which you render your judgment. If you're judging Barack Obama uh, as a capitalist, uh, constitutional republic, based on democratic principles sort of politician, he is highly incompetent. If you're judging him from the perspective of him being a radical Islamist and a communist who's trying to destroy the United States of America and bring about a, a collapse of, of, of our nation and a transition, a transformation, to use his words, to communism, he's highly successful, highly competent. Nobody's been this successful ever at doing this. So I often talk about political perspective. Sometimes I call my students, I tell my students it is political context or historical context. You need to use historical context when you judge what somebody is saying. Why are they saying what they're saying? Let's, what's the political context with which they're saying it? Schumer came out the other day, a Jewish senator from you know, New York, against the Iran nuclear deal. He did it because he was given the freedom to do that from the president. He would never go against the president, but he was given the license to do that. Viewed, let's talk about the uh, grassroots viewed from the political in, a, in a political perspective I say there's three kinds of people in the United States of America today and I mentioned this to you before there's those kind of people who retain their individual freedom and they absolutely know they're free the second type is do we have people in society who do not retain individual freedom they know they are slaves in that virtual gulag which I wrote that article a week or two ago and as such they know they're not free they're aware of this Lou and then you have people who do not retain individual freedom but they don't know that they don't know that they are actually slaves inside the virtual gulag and as such are not free and for us in the United States of America uh, because insurrection from within and that will use both witting and unwitting accomplices to this treason that's the problem that's the threat we face this last group of people, from that perspective, is the most dangerous in our society because they know not what they do. They are indeed unwitting accomplices to the collapse of America. These mind rape people, as I coined that phrase, do not realize they are indeed prisoners living in the virtual gulag, complete with the chains of communist slavery and forced labor. Freedom today is relative freedom. None of us is completely free except maybe Mr. and Mrs. Clinton and Mrs. Weiner. All of us have some chains in our behavior, economic chains, religious chains, morality, health, education, employment, um, geographic, family, etc. All of us live in some version of Plato's allegory of the cave, which I'll talk about later on in the future. Well, what do you think about that? I, well, I, I, I think you're you're absolutely right, and I think you made a really good point. Like, who is absolutely free? We talk about how free we are in this country, but to some extent, we are slaves to that oligarchy, even though we haven't chosen to be. So those of those of us who choose to, like you said, not work, or you know, um, and forget the ones who can't work. Those who choose to not work, and um, you know collect an entitlement they've chosen to be slaves the o oligarchy has enslaved those of us who didn't choose to be because such a large percentage of us have chosen to be I agree um, during the next segment if we're getting close to a uh, break I want to I want to talk about uh, Miss Davis uh, up in uh, Kentucky and uh, discuss that for a little bit uh, with you and, and uh, any of the people that are listening out there because I think it's what's happening to her is just a travesty and it is coming and getting worse and worse by the day. Um, we, have a, we have a really quick um, station promo. 
okay. for your favorite people. I'm gonna oh. lead in oh. lead in with a little bluegrass, and we'll be right back because I'm sh- I'd like to talk to you about Miss Davis, and I'm sure that the audience would like to hear about that. So we'll be back shortly. Remember, lock up children and the old folks. Game on. Where no one is safe. No one is fair. Not even the host. Oh, that was supposed to be a sin. Yeah, that's okay. We love you. Right, right, right. Anyway. Anybody? Hold the host, monkey. Where's the host? 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 You're listening, You're listening to K-98 Talk. And we're back, Dr. Arrington. Let's I'm talk here. and let's talk about Miss Davis. Kim Davis, uh, I believe it's Ashland, Kentucky. She's the county clerk up there. Has been for uh, I don't know twenty years or more. Maybe it's twenty one or twenty seven. I can't remember. The reports uh, said, but uh, Miss Davis refused to issue marriage licenses to gay couples. In fact, she refused to issue marriage licenses. Period. And then a federal judge, the son of. A Hall of Fame Phillies pitcher Jim Bunning uh, threw her in jail, and you know what, Lou? Threw her in jail without bail. Even John Wayne Gacy, Ted Bundy, and son of Sam Killer Berkowitz in New York had bail terms. Of course, they couldn't meet them, but they had terms for bail. If they couldn't meet them, they could have gotten out of prison. She's and Bunning has put her in jail with with absolutely no bail. I want to ask you this question, Lou. What laws did Kim Davis break? Cite the cite the law case law. Cite the law for me. What law did she break? Yeah, I wouldn't be able to do that. I certainly don't know of one. She broke none, no laws. And if it's a matter of her not um, upholding a law here or there, then you know that's a, a conflict between the state law and the federal law. And what? I, I I seem to remember another elected official that has difficulty following the law and upholding the law, and then sanctuary city mayors. Uh, Are we going to put them in jail? I, I, if I was president, I would I, immediately. Um, it seems a little unfair, though. Well, they they always go back to the Fourteenth Amendment. I don't think these scholars, uh, so-called lawyers, actually understand uh, the the Fourteenth Amendment and what it was d- designed to do and prevent. It was it was basically written for former slaves, uh, black Americans. There's no such thing as an anchor baby, but that's the way they ha- have uh, interpreted it. Even Bill O'Reilly thinks that, and I'm sorry, sir, you're wrong. Uh, there's no automatic citizenship if you come across that border uh, in El Paso and drop a baby. There's not. This uh, Miss Kim Davis is an elected Democrat. I have a question for you, Lou. What if she was a Muslim Democrat and did the same thing? What would happen? Uh, I, probably nothing. I, I'd have to say nothing. I, and and the um, 
the assumption was on Twitter in the news and you know this is a conservative woman she's a thereby she's a Republican no she's not she's a Democrat they, they always want to fit uh, the circumstances even they, they even though they don't fit they want to fit it into their talking points their narrative their agenda uh, the guy that well, you know shot Trayvon Martin uh, during that episode down there, uh, they called him a white Hispanic. What the, what the hell is that? A white Hispanic? Uh, well, know, it, is... it, it, it would never fly in any other situation. If you're Hispanic, you're Hispanic, yeah. except for that that one situation. This, this is a great example, mm -hmm. a contemporary example going on right now. She's in jail right now, her fourth or fifth day, of the law of God Almighty himself versus the law of man. The founding fathers believed and wrote it into the Constitution and in the Declaration of Independence, the rule of God is supreme. And what's interesting uh, or ironic is that Christians were forewarned that they would be ruthlessly persecuted because, precisely because of their faith in God and their faith in His Son, Jesus Christ. But maybe I'm just spitballing here, Lou. Maybe I'm just spitballing here. No, no, I'm certain I read that somewhere before that we would be persecuted. Of course, that comes from Colonel Nathan Jessup in the movie A Few Good Men, and Jack Nicholson said those famous, you know, lines from the screenplay. <laughs> I've read that somewhere before. Freedom of religion, in fact, is in the First Amendment. So they they, they said that was like the most important, Lou. And 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 and. Much to the dismay of, of many, I believe, it's not a freedom from religion that we're guaranteed. It's a freedom of religion. And no one is guaranteed a freedom from religion. That's correct. Nowhere in the Constitution, I'm sorry, gay activists, you can come at me all you want on Twitter or Facebook, nowhere in the Constitution does it say that men have the right to marry men or that women have the right to marry women. Same-sex marriage rights do not exist. A Supreme Court decision is not a law. It's merely a decision. In this case, it was five to four. I think it was Obergefell versus Hodges. It's, a, it's a, not a law. I'm sorry. Come at me now. What do you think? No, I think you're absolutely right, and I think that that's a fundamental under misunderstanding among the sheep because they've been told by the wolves that this is your right you should demand it but you've talked about and I've talked about and Locke does a really good job of talking about and there's so much of what John Locke says is actually prophetic you know his treatise on words which is in human understanding <clears throat> is a is a prophecy almost for what we need to look out for way before Trotsky was born of exactly what Lenin and Trotsky and those so, that socialist movement, the the communist movement was going to do, twisting words and twisting in the ideas around words so that they mean something different. And the special interest groups and what what they would be doing. And when I say special interest group, activist groups, Black Lives Matter, people like that, that foment dis discourse among the people. That just makes the power stronger among the powerful. I agree with that. And there's, there's somebody out there right now that, that foments this discord and discontent. But I told you offline, uh, when I'm talking about Mrs. Clinton, it doesn't matter who wins the nomination for the Democratic Party or the Republican Party. It does not matter from this perspective. Whoever it is, is still going to get 40% of the vote, 42%, somewhere in there. What's up for grabs is that you know that uh, sixteen percent or so, uh, eighteen percent, twenty percent, whatever, somewhere in the middle, that's up for grabs. So if you end up winning an election sixty to forty, that's a that's a that's a Dr. A's classic definition of a landslide. Um, I'm going to tell you right now, Mrs. Clinton and her uh, email uh, server sca scandal, she's committed treason. I'm going to tell you that right now, Mrs. Clinton. I. I sent this out on Twitter today and I got all sorts of people coming after me uh, I wrote Mrs. Clinton and then in big yelling letters or what do you call that when you uh, have all caps I'm yelling Mrs. Clinton not honest not qualified not trustworthy not a leader not capable not trustful not tr not truthful sorry not innocent not now 
not ever. You know what, Lou? The FBI does not investigate policy breaches at the State Department. The FBI only investigates criminal activity. Yep. She is really good, a really good little actress, if you will. Mm -hmm. uh, some of my Hollywood friends would like that. Uh, she plays the innocent very, very well. Her server tech is now getting ready to uh, plead the fifth. I would venture to say that Mrs. Weiner, you call her Uma, Mrs. <laughs> Weiner uh, will plead the fifth. Cheryl Mills will plead the fifth. Um, now Cheryl Mills was it was actually questioned I think last week. Who uh -huh. my Mrs. Weiner I do not believe has been questioned yet. Cheryl Mills had a lapse of memory, I recall. Yes, she did. She had yeah. significant memory lapses, according yeah. to the committee. But she was questioned behind closed doors. They are not making uh, these uh, public in in an effort to get more information out of them. Yet they still can't get information out of them. And I want to tell you something, Doctor Ray. I well. observed a couple of FBI investigations when I was in a very regula regulated industry. Uh -huh. And I can tell you that there is not an email that exists on the internet, that ever existed on the internet, that the FBI cannot find. Yeah. Um, I've actually watched them do it from servers that were, uh, from backup servers and backups of backups. And they can pull emails pretty much out of thin air. And this was 15 years ago. And they'll look you yeah. straight in the eye and tell you that they'll pull one out of thin air. And, um, you know, if they could do that then, there's only, you know, there's there's no telling what they could do now. It, it's only a matter of time, like you said before, it's fully exposed exactly what she did. But even some of the, the blips that have come out regarding her sensitive conversations that she had with someone who was forbidden from even working for the State Department, not didn't have a security clearance, and she was communicating with him, Sidney Blumenthal, about sensitive issues. I think that falls under the definition of treason, does it not? It does, and I always say her goose, her goose is simmering, and pretty soon her goose is going to be cooked. Uh, right now, there's some knucklehead on uh, uh, the black market, if you want to call it that, that alleges he's got for sale all of Mrs. Clinton's emails he hacked into her account. I think Trey Gowdy uh, is a good, uh, honorable, decent man, and I, I think mm -hmm. he's going to get to the bottom of this eventually if he's given the latitude to do that. I'm not so sure. Uh, it's a big if. Yeah, I'm not so sure about Boehner, what, what his motivation is. I think his motivation is simply uh, he's for John Boehner and doesn't want to rock the boat. And uh, so, uh, if he, yeah, I think you're right about that. Yeah, if Trey Gowdy is given the latitude, I, I think he'll uh, he'll come up with uh, the actual evidence. And I think you're right about uh, the FBI. They'll they'll find it, and they're going to find out that uh, she she committed uh, heinous treason. And yeah, I, they I will find them. There's not you can't get rid of an email that says that the FBI can't find it. They'll trace down the MX records, and they'll find it on the internet if they have to, or at least that's what they'll tell you. Exactly. I, I think that the reason this is happening right now, and I mentioned this to uh, Stacy uh, Lennox, that, that uh, this is coming from Mr. Clinton himself and probably from Mrs. Clinton, I mean, uh, coming from Mr. Obama himself and Mrs. Obama and Valerie Jarrett, our uh, queen in chief, our president in chief, who really pulls the shots. I think the three of them cannot stand. Mrs. and Mr. Clinton, and they do not ever want to see Mrs. Clinton as president, first female president. They want her to go away, uh, drift off into life uh, quietly, bye bye. Yeah. I think that they would rather have uh, Michelle Obama be the first uh, so called female president. Well, let me yeah. ask you I have, a, I have a theory, so I'd like for you oh, to I kind hear. of analyze my my theory about are you, that. Are you a conspiracy theorist? Like not that. at all. Not at all. Oh. So I think this makes perfect sense. And so you tell me what you think about this. They have moved this country in a direction that they wanted it moved, and they feel like they've made a lot of progress. Bill Clinton, on the other hand, was uh, very much a politician's politician and a compromiser, and the Republicans got a lot more done in Congress under Bill Clinton than they ever would have under Barack Obama. Their biggest fear, I think, 
is that all the progress that they've made, and you can, you know, point to any number of people at the top of the DNC, from Wasserman Schultz to, you know, Sally Cohn to uh, Barack, o, Barack and Michelle Obama, to to any of those guys, Valor, Valerie Jarrett probably being the king, the the ringleader, as you said. They see Clinton as a slide backwards for their progress. Is say that one more time. They they, they see him back backsliding. They yes they they believe that Hillary Clinton would actually be a slide backwards for their progress. That she would be a compromiser like Bill. That her administration would look more like Bill Clinton's administration than Barack Obama's administration. I, I totally agree and. Uh, one thing you got to remember, though, about uh, Mr. Clinton and all the things that were attributed as successes for him, he had nothing to do with it. He just signed it. He had nothing to do with it. Other well, he than vetoed signing. it he before no he signed it. <laughs> he had no choice. Absolutely no choice, and he vetoed a lot of it before he signed it. Yeah. And it was overridden, and that was the only reason he ever signed it is because it was just gonna. They were just gonna keep overriding his vetoes until he signed them. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. I agree. Um, but they don't want to see Hillary Clinton do that same thing. They they truly believe that uh, Barack Hussein Obama is going to have uh, a great political legacy, and he is. Unfortunately, it's not going to be the great political legacy that they think uh, it's going to be deleterious. It's going to be. He, I teach the American presidency. Barack Hussein Obama is the absolute worst president in the history of the United States. He beats Jimmy Carter by a landslide. He is the worst president ever. If you're looking at it from the perspective of Democratic, Constitutional, Republican actually taking care of America. If you're looking at it from the perspective of uh, I want to take the American uh, system down and transform it, well he's been highly successful, but I don't think that anybody that's not mind raped believes that. We want the United States we want the United States, I'll quote Mr. Trump, Mr. Trump uh, I want to make America great again well, and that's the genius of his candidacy is that, first of all, that tagline, you know, that's, and, and there is a lot of genius behind his run. I, I, I you know what I, I tell you all the time about, about Mr. Trump uh, is he is going to uh, add some value uh, to the campaign trail. Uh, despite his, uh, his blatant political incorrectness, Donald Trump does add value and sort of a feisty spirit uh, to that GOP um, nomination uh, campaign trail uh, his presence and he's not going away because he's got lots of money uh, he's self-financing his presence will indeed force all the other candidates to address uh, controversial issues the kinds of issues that they'd rather avoid addressing uh, or that they would like to just give vague softball answers and responses to uh, Lord knows that all the GOP candidates need to be much more aggressive than they've been in the past two campaigns. And I see people all the time that are just spending so much wasted effort on uh, denigrating Mr. Trump. And I always come out with the same, the same uh, speech or line for them. Stop swinging at pitches in the dirt. Trump will toughen up all the candidates. Focus on what's really important. What's really important, Lou, is electing a candidate nominating a candidate and then electing a candidate who is a real um, honorable courageous and trustworthy conservative that will do once in office what we want him or her to do that's the candidate that will eventually survive and eventually uh, inevitably win the nomination and i think will become our next president and our next commander in chief and i told you the great analogy i was used uh, was and i like star trek growing up i think you probably did too the real original star trek uh, with Captain Kirk and Mr. Spock, there was an episode there called The Squire of Gophos. And I say, hey, Donald Trump is very much like the Squire of Gophos episode on Star Trek. A rich but very bored child of the gods, and that's gods with a small g, who is uh, in the episode is playing around and having a, a grand old time, having fun while hunting down Captain Kirk with his rifle for sport. Uh, I say that the adult gods, with a small g, in the room will take away Mr. Trump's playing privileges soon enough. But here's, here's my prophetic, not pathetic, but prophetic uh, <laughs> statement. I don't really think that Mr. Trump is going to win the nomination, but 
he could win the nomination. If things start turning in him more in his direction, which they, they happen, happen to be doing right now, he could buck all the odds and win that nomination and could end up sitting in Pennsylvania at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue one day, much to the chagrin of that uh, Cornell chick, Stacy, uh, what's her name? Lennox. <laughs> <laughs> he could, but even, um, and I, I definitely am not going to speak for, for her, but even uh, even Stacy, I don't think, would, would vote Democrat, even if it, Trump was, was the other candidate. But I think that... Um, what we need to think about is is who who is going to get people to the polls right because it's not every election comes down to who motivates their their voters to get out to the polls and who motivates the independents to vote for them so you know i i just hope that the party makes the right decisions that the people voting and then, then there's the delegate thing that you have to worry about and it's it's really crazy and it's gotten a little bit um i, I hope we do make that uh invisible primary thing a topic for our show because i think that we could really get into what goes on there and um you know open some minds about how the process works behind the scenes well we could do that next uh, sunday at three o'clock that'd be fun to talk about there's there's always something going on uh, that we could talk about you know uh they actually had in the communist soviet union they actually had elections and uh, uh stalin uncle joe used to say um it doesn't matter who votes it only matters who counts the votes <laughs> and in the united states of america it, it doesn't matter who votes it only matters who puts up which candidates to be voted on, and that's the that's part of the invisible primary. And I told you, uh, they want the Jebster uh, on the right, and, and the lefties, the communists, want uh, Mrs. Clinton. But I, I, I truly believe that the Barack Obama's not going to let that happen. I think that might be that might be his greatest achievement as a politician to get rid of Mrs. Clinton, send her off to probably ten years of probation. I don't know if they'll ever put her in jail. Uh, but maybe, but she'll be gone, and you'll never have to worry about her again. She, either, she should never, ever, ever hold any kind of political power whatsoever. I think she blackmailed Mr. Obama uh, during the first election, 2008. Says, look, you either uh, agree to make me Secretary of State once you get elected, if you get elected, or right now, then right now, I'm going to go independent, and that will split the Democratic vote, and you will not get elected, and it will be the Republican that gets elected. I think from that point it was going to be uh, uh, Senator McCain. I think she actually did that. It's happened in our history many, many, many times before yeah. Henry Clay did it, and uh, that, that's what prevented Andrew Jackson from becoming president. That's what put uh, John Adams' uh, son in the White House uh, as the fifth president, uh, John Quincy Adams, because Henry Clay threw his delegates to John Quincy for in exchange for being Secretary of State, mm -hmm. and, uh, so that's what happened there. Yeah, uh, absolutely, and it and it happens a lot. I mean, did that kind of like deal making, and you know, and it, 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 the amazing thing that happened last week is that they were asking Hillary about her campaign. It may have been the the end of the week before, but she actually has a conversation with the press about not just talking to the people and it not being just about the votes of the people but it also being about the delegates and her having to court the delegates and she is actually having this conversation with the press and I'm thinking yeah. what is she doing what's going on in her head I can tell you what's going on in her head she's engaging in the invisible primary and uh, that's something that's been uh, happening in the United States for a long, long time. Exactly, but she's got to think that we're all too stupid to pick on what, pick up on what she's doing, and that's the aggravating thing to many of us. I think about liberals is that they act like they just think we're too stupid, and a lot of Republicans are acting the same way. Um, they want to protect their own little fiefdom of political power, and um, you got to realize that. Um, that knucklehead economist, uh, I can't remember his name, doctor, whatever it was, said that uh, they counted on the ignorance or the stupidity of the American people. Gruber. <laughs> yeah, uh, Jonathan Gruber. Yeah. There's a whole bunch of people out there, Lou, 
that are stupid. Mm -hmm. Either they, they choose to be or they actually are. And I, I, somebody was uh, jumping on Angela earlier, and, and I, I jumped in there and you know, gave Dr. Ace two cents. And I, I try to be as respectful as I can, but sometimes you just can't be. And I said, I said to this one woman, I said, she was talking about the Iran nuclear deal, which we can talk about one day, how the Iran nuclear deal, she's so happy that we need three more. Barbara Mikulski, a senator from Maryland, was in on this uh, Twitter feed. She's so happy just we need three more, and then we're going to get that nuke deal, and Barack Obama's going to solidify the nuke deal, and, and then we'll have, never have any more wars. I, nothing can be further than the truth. And I, I said to her, ma'am, you are some special kind of stupid. <laughs> stupid cannot be fixed. Yeah. It just can't. And I, you know, I always say with all due respect, you are some special kind of stupid. And either they've been totally mind raped or they have no brain whatsoever uh, from an analytical point of view. Well, and I mean, it, it, or a very, very short view of history. Well, and Hillary Clinton uh, actually believes that she is, she operates with total impunity. I believe that. She is a pathological liar and a sociopath simultaneously. Read Dr. A's article. She is. I document some of those things. She is. And she thinks she's going to... She doesn't know how to not lie. I guarantee you. And another thing, uh, you talk about Debbie Wasserman Schultz and the, you know, um, uh, Matthews asked her what's the difference between the Republican, the Democrats and socialism. She was taken back by that question. That was a question she never expected. She expects softball questions by that compliant mainstream media. Mm -hmm. She didn't know how to answer it. I'm going to tell you right now, listen up, listen up, Dr. Ray's going to tell you the truth. Debbie does socialism, but she doesn't know it apparently. She does do socialism. Oh, she knows it. She just doesn't want to admit it. Well, and, and that's a problem too, because she's a slave as well. Yeah, she's a wolf. She's in the, she's in the, she is a wolf that lives in that virtual gulag. Yeah. Absolutely, or, or or keeps people in the virtual gulag, right? So we talked about what's the difference. Are you are you compliant and or or blind to what's going on, or are you one of the wolves and you know exactly what's going on and you're part of the problem? I'd put her in the part of the problem category. I uh, she's one of the ones I just I listen to her in my mouth. My, my mouth drops open like a horse. Right. Did she just say that? Yeah, Why and they did, and they get away with that. And I don't think they believe it, right? I mean, some of them, obviously their job is to get people to believe it. Yeah. But, I, you know, I see people all the time, and uh, like, the, like the trolls in Putin's farm, they don't, um, they don't believe, you know, they don't believe what they're saying. No. But they're saying it anyway, and they want to convince you. So we got one minute, Doc. Okay, the, the, she, Debbie Wasserman Schultz. Barack Obama, Hillary Clinton, all these people, Mrs. Clinton, they are in, they are invested, maybe infested would be a better word, yeah, invested in communism. And, and they know it. They can't, they cannot go away from it because they lose all credibility. They lose their power if they, if they speak the truth. The consequences they would have to endure would be unbearable for them. You know what, Lou? I speak the truth. Dr. A always speaks the truth, and then I will endure those inevitable consequences that come steamrolling my way. I'm sure it's going to happen. It's probably already happening. I haven't looked at my phone. But uh, it was wonderful to be have you uh, in office hours today with Dr. A. Let's do it again uh, next Sunday at 3. Absolutely. We're pulling out our pr pruning shears from a, a, by a friend of mine called Tennessee Jed. We will be right back here on K98 Talk next Sunday at 3 p.m. for a couple of hours of office hours with Dr. A. And you guys have a wonderful um, Labor Day holiday, and we'll see you next week.
When our, when water, our water heater, heater broke, broke down, down last, last month, it was, it was a nightmare. nightmare. It took, it took five, five hours for the plumber, plumber to show up. And he charged, and he charged us a couple, a couple of hundred bucks just to come out. out. And then it cost, then it cost another $1,800 to put, to put in the new water heater. heater. By, the By the time it was, it was all said and done, done, I felt like I'd been taken. But what else could I do? The smartest thing you can do is get a home warranty from American Residential Warranty. Their home warranty is paid to repair or replace all your major appliances when they break. And they will break. And at the worst possible time, call American Residential warranty, warranty right, right now. now. For free, free information, information on home warranties, home warranties starting, starting at just pennies, pennies a day. Don't, don't, don't wait for your refrigerator, refrigerator to stop running or your ceiling, ceiling fans to stop turning. turning. Call, Call American, American Residential, residential warranty, warranty right now. Right now. Ask, Ask how you, you can save up to 50% of the washer, washer and dryer coverage. coverage. Just call 1-800-513-6154. That's 1-800-513-6154. Call American Residential Warranty. Call now. Tired, Tired of paying, paying out rage just prices, prices for Viagra? Viagra? Well, well, we have great, great news, news for you. Now, now you can, can finally, finally get Viagra, Viagra at, at huge discounts. discounts. Healthy, Healthy Man allows, allows you to save up to $500 on Viagra. On Viagra. Why, Why pay, pay U.S. pay pharmacy, pharmacy prices, prices of $15, $15 per, per pill, pill or more, or more when, when you can get Viagra for less than $3 a pill? Call today and get 40 Viagra pills for only $99. This can cost as much as $600 at your local pharmacy. You can afford not to call us. If you want Viagra at the lowest prices, never pay $15. Pharmacy pharmacy prices prices again. Again. Get, Get Viagra, Viagra for, for, less for less than $3, than $3 a bill. Call 1 800 516 7602 today and save, and save up, up to $500, $500 and get 40, 40 pills for just $99. Healthy, Healthy Man is fast, fast easy, and affordable. And affordable. Operators, Operators are waiting, waiting at 1 800 516 7602 to take your call right now. Call 1 800 516 7602. That's 1 800 516 7602. Again, 1 800 516 7602. 